to welcome everybody to episode 59 live from my drum room. Today we are doing the drums of Charlie Watts part two with two very special guests. Uh, you might remember part one, I had Richard King, uh, an old friend and vintage drum man from uh, Annapolis, Maryland, and uh, someone who's who's known Charlie for a long time and sold Charlie a lot of his vintage gear. And also Don McCauley, Charlie's drum tech for about the last 10 years, who's now out with the Stones um, as tech for Steve Jordan. So we we're lucky to get Don to join us today. It's a day off on the Stones tour and uh, this worked out perfectly. So I'm really excited to have these guys with me today. I wanna have a, uh, send out a special shout out to everybody watching from the Charlie Watts Appreciation page on Facebook, uh, the page that I started a couple of months ago that I'm proud to say we've reached, has hit 4,000 members as of yesterday or the day before. We're 4,000 members and, and growing. So that's exciting. Um, and that's in spite of the spammers that I keep kicking off. So uh, even with that, we're still over 4,000 members. So thanks to everybody who's joined that page um, it's great to have such a, uh, a great group of people in there that, that, uh, you know, love and respect Charlie so much and, um, are so interested and eager to learn about him the way, you know, I see so many people in there. So thanks for, for joining that, that group. Um, really appreciate that. I want to thank everybody also for watching my show with Sean Pelton, uh, earlier this, or I should say last Monday, I guess it was last week, beginning of last week. It was a great show with Sean, so thank you. And to everyone who's continued to watch these shows and subscribe to the YouTube channel and my podcasts, thank you for that. Um, last thing I want to do, uh, last thing I want to do is just send out a quick clarification uh, on something that Richard King and I spoke about last time on the part one of this show of the uh, drums of Charlie Watts. Uh, we, Richard had mentioned Charlie endorsing uh, Peisty symbols and having a sort of uh, brief or limited endorsement with Peisty. And uh, I just wanted to take a second, you know, to sort of clarify that um, I spoke with Charlie many times. Anybody who knows me and knows my history knows that I worked for Zildjian for many years, uh, 24 years. And that's when I met Charlie, it was about 25 years ago. And, um, you know, really more as a fan than anything else, I asked him about his history with Peisty because I was curious really about the sound of his symbols on, on so many of these records. And he didn't have a, a real clear recollection. He did say he did use them, uh, you know, at different times and at some point, but um, wasn't, he couldn't clearly, rec you know, recollect on which records he played what. But he was quick to point out that he never officially endorsed them. And he made some, this is, this was early on in my relationship with Charlie, probably about 25 years ago. I remember us being together and just him and I talking and I asked him about that. And I told him, I said, you know, I, I, I'm just, it, I'm taking off my Zildjian hat when, uh, when I'm asking you about this. And it's really more, you know, as a fan. And, you know, I, I just would love to know, like, was that a Peisty symbol on, this record or that record and um and you know as i say he couldn't remember clearly what he played on what but but he did say that something to the effect of um you know i know they say that i i know they say that i'm one of their artists but i'm really not you know i i've, I've played them but I'm, i don't endorse them something to that effect so um really out of respect and love for charlie i wanted to just clarify that um because I think if he were still with us, he, he would want to make that clarification. And only because he really never endorsed any company, um, even Gretsch drums, which he played from 1968 until, you know, last year or this year. He never really officially was an endorser, though I, can, I think he considered himself a Gretsch drummer. And he had over the years built and developed a relationship with the people at Gretsch, but you know, he never signed an endorsement contract with them. He played whatever he wanted to play. And, uh, and that's what I, I love the most about Charlie. And I think so many people love the most about Charlie is he was so true and so genuine and so, um, 
you know, just, just, he was his own person when it came to that, you know? Uh, so I wanted to make, in fact, if you look at this, this Peisty profiles uh, ad from, or from their profiles book from 1972, he's listed playing Heyman drums. And I'm absolutely certain he never played Heyman drums. So, you know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, I think it's, I think there were some liberties taken and I'll just leave it at that. Um, so that's it. That's all I wanted to say about that. Uh, got a lot of great stuff to talk about today. And I don't want to take up any more time personally because my two guests have so many great things to share with everyone about Charlie. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring on Don McCauley, Charlie's drum tech, and Richard King, live from my drum room, room episode 59. And here hey. they are, live. Hey, Johnny. Hi, boys. Hey, hey. Welcome to the show. It's our returning champion, Don McCauley. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just bored. <laughs> Something to do. <laughs> no, I, I I appreciate you doing this on a day off. I know you're on a yeah. you're on tour, so this is a, it's a great thing. It's really cool that what you're doing, and uh, and it, it is. It's really it's really obviously unfortunate, but it's a really great way to honor Charlie. Oh, thanks, yeah. Don. I appreciate yeah. that. And and I you know and, and Richard, I I appreciate you you know reaching out back you know, whenever that was a, a few weeks back and you said, Hey, we should, we should do a show about Charlie's drums, you know, and we, we've been doing all these other tributes and, you know, remembrances and, and what a great idea to, to do something dedicated to his gear. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Was that a team effort? Team effort. Yeah. Well, got the two best players in the team right here with me today. So, yeah. So where should we where should we start off, guys? Where would you where would you guys like to sort of uh, jump in or or kick it off? Well, it seems like Richard, you were on a roll earlier. You know, the, the first one uh, was some good stuff, some really really cool information stuff that you had done. So it seems seems fitting that you just continue. Okay, some of that. Yeah, you know? yeah I yep. kind of want to bring up you know Chooch uh, Chooch McGee. Um, he's the one that kind of brought us all together and, uh, and he kind of, uh, made all this possible in a very disconnected or connected way, just a long series of the chain of events. You know, there's this wonderful book called Roadwork by, uh, uh Tom Mitchell, uh, and, uh, Tom Wright, I'm sorry. And it, it features, uh, Chooch. There's a chapter in here dedicated to Chooch McGee, uh, when he passed away. And this is, this is Chooch's chapter. And it's a good read for if anybody wants to find it, road work. It's all about the roadies, the famous roadies. And uh, and uh, Don is the, the next generation of famous roadies. So <laughs> it's good to have him here, man. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And there's Chooch and I. That's in Philadelphia back in like, uh, I would say, 1997 or 1998. Cool. And uh, Chooch, uh, Chooch was a very busy man uh, because he had not only did he have Charlie's drums to tend to, but he also had to take care of uh, Ronnie Wood's guitars, and he also watched over Mick Jagger's guitars. So he had a lot of draw jobs to do. And whenever I would talk with him, he would call me up or whatever. He was always busy, busy. Hey, Rich, I got to get go. I got to go. Charlie, you know, Charlie's doing this, Mick's doing that. And he's just a very, very busy man, you know, and they really had him <laughs> running from one end of the spectrum to the other because he, he, even when the Stones were on tour, were not on tour, he was always busy taking stuff to make at his house or going to Ronnie Wood's studio or helping Keith out with something. And uh, he's just an amazing guy and uh, he did it all. And the funny thing about uh, uh, Chooch is he really wasn't a musician. He could find a bang on the drums a little bit and twang on a guitar, but he really didn't play. And uh, so he would always find people to take care of various jobs for him. And, uh, and that's how I came into the picture, you know, the, uh, the Rolling Stones got back together in 1989 to do the Steel Wheels tour, and they hadn't toured at that point for about five years. And so they had made up their mind that uh, they were going to get back on the road. And uh, by this point, uh, Chooch became the stage manager for all the road crew, because uh, the, or the crew chief, I'm sorry, because uh, up to that point, Ian Stewart was the crew chief and in charge of all the boys, all the lads' equipment for all those years. And when in Ian Stewart passed away in 1985, by de facto, the next guy in line 
was uh, was Chooch. And you can see him in a lot of the old videos of the Stones playing, running behind Charlie or handing a guitar to Ronnie or whatever. He's a very, very busy guy. And so he was always looking, you know, for things to get done. And that, that's where I caught, came in. He called me in the March or May of 1989 and wanted to find a, a bass drum to replace the one that they'd been using. And uh, so I, you know, myself, I, I'm kind of the guy that, that uh, people call up. I do a lot of work with celebrities. For, they want to find certain things or get certain things done or repaired. They call me up. I'm not really a drum builder. Um, I'm not really a fabricator of anything like that, you know? And um, so I, I contacted a guy named Ward Wilson down at Atlanta Pro Percussion. And I've got some pictures here of, of Ward uh, and we sent him a 22 inch Gretsch bass drum. Um, and these pictures just came up. I, I mentioned Ward in the last video and he sent me all these pictures that I'd never seen before. And so it was really grateful to see those. And uh, there was pictures of him uh, with, the, uh, with the drum when it was finished. And there's also a picture of the drum before he did any work to it. It was just a champagne sparkle round badge bass drum. And he uh, refinished it in the natural maple finish. And, uh, and that bass drum basically sat behind Charlie for many, many years, uh, for many, many tours. And uh, it got used on a couple of recordings on the Voodoo Lounge tour, got used on some recordings uh, where they did some, they set up a little drum kit in the hallway, in the stairway, and they set the bass drum and the, and the snare drum. That kit was, that kick drum was used. Uh, so it got used for a lot of different things, but also in the Voodoo Lounge tour, they started doing this concept where they would have like a B stage out front that's Ward right now, Ward Wilson. And that's what the drum after it was all finished and cleaned up and, and uh, he'd filled in all the holes. It had extra holes from different tom holders and stuff in there. And then he refinished it in like a really pretty maple. And that, that drum got a lot of use, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really glad to see that, uh, that he, I'm really glad that Ward pr provided all these photographs. And uh, from that point on, um, uh, we, we were on contact to do a lot of things. Now, what happened also is when we delivered that drum to uh, Charlie in the, in the fall of 1989, when they were doing rehearsals for Steel Wheels, we also brought some other drums with us. I brought a Gretsch Green Sparkle drum kit, and I also brought a couple of snare drums, and Charlie ended up buying that Green Sparkle kit. And uh, he just absolutely fell in love with it. He wanted to use it with his, uh, with the big band, with the, the, the orchestra, the Charlie Watts orchestra is what we wanted to use. And um, <clears throat> he really uh, was really excited about it. And so after he bought it, I took it back to the shop and uh, he, Chooch called me up about a week later and says, hey, Charlie wants all the hardware done in gold, uh, 24 karat gold, you know? So we sent <laughs> every bit, every piece down to Nashville to a place called Advanced Plating. And this is the only piece I've got left. Um, there's the snare drum from, from the kit when we put it together. And as you can see, it's just a green spark with just a perfectly stock uh, snare drum. And we had all the hardware done in gold. And Charlie was so, so tickled with that kit that he ended up uh, having a suit made to go with it. And I think you've got a picture of that in your... Uh, <laughs> Of, of the Charlie with that suit and he says and he sent me a photograph from that session and uh not too long after that it was featured in a in a magazine uh in England called Rhythm Drum Magazine oh and yes I yep posted some pictures of, uh with that and uh and they did a big spread on it you know they had all, a photographer come in there and do all these photographs and uh so before that was sent out I was sent this thing which was uh autographed by Charlie and sent to me by Chooch to uh, commemorate that that drum set you know <laughs> and cool. it was a real kick and i don't think he ever really got to use it you know I, he was i asked him why he didn't use it and he basically said that it was so pretty that he was afraid that something was going to happen to it that he he just wanted to he just loved looking at it and i think he even brought it to his house god forbid uh of course <laughs> it didn't stay there <laughs> and, uh, and he, he just never used that kit. So I have this little gold-plated tea rod, Gretsch tea rod that's left over. And just in case we ever needed it. <laughs> oh, and wow. that was the green sparkle kit, you know. And all along uh, during this time, I would get calls from Chooch for all kinds of stuff like drumsticks. It didn't have an endorsement then. Now they have that Vicperth endorsement. But at the time, they were only using these old Ludwig 11S drumsticks. And uh, he basically sent me around the country looking for 11S drumsticks. 
and uh, we would find boxes of them at different music stores because they were still making them at the time, of course. So yeah. we'd buy up as many cases of those as we could get. And so that was basically my job was to basically supply Chooch with whatever he was looking for, you know. Uh, the other thing that he was looking for, and, and I'm really, and maybe Don can answer this question, is in 1985 on the last tour that they did, and I can't remember the name of that tour, it's a, the one with Beast of Burden, um, he was using Rogers memory lock cymbal stands and he had a Rogers hi-hat and it, the Rogers hi-hat that he had with that kit at that point was an older Rogers hi-hat because I could see in the pictures that they had a memory lock clamp, uh, I mean, sorry, like a hose clamp from a car to hold it from sliding it down because that those stands were notorious for stripping out, you know, if you used them a lot. And so somewhere between 1985 and 1989, when I met him, he had switched over to the Gretsch Techware stands. And Don has had a nightmare with those things, you know. <laughs> we remedied that Don, situation. Yeah. 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 And Don had to actually get the uh, tilters made for them because the tilters would just snap, you know. Yeah. They broke oh, right we, off we, at the middle of a rehearsal, one of the, the original Techware, because it was, it was just cheap white metal. You know, so he yeah. went to China one time and we were at rehearsals in a big like Wembley arena or something and just mm. went to whack it and the whole thing came straight down at him, sheared oh right off and right towards <laughs> him. So we had uh, is it Mike uh, Dorfman, I think it is, at Trick, had him yeah, yeah. Re recreate yeah. the, uh, the top ratchet part um, in air airplane aluminum so it didn't break, so it just would not break. Oh man! I had about God. twenty-five of those made, and Mike gave us like just you know amazing turnaround and uh, yeah. and just matched them up perfectly, so that didn't have to worry about that anymore. Thank God! Wow. Yeah, I yeah, I, I think I remember you telling me this, Don, and 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 I can tell you, I I was working in the eighties. I was working retail when um, the techware stuff came out. It came out. It was made, I think, by the same company. You guys might remember Richard. You might remember. Um, North drums. Remember the North drums that had the the um, <laughs> elbow shaped fiberglass shell, and they made hardware in the early '80s. Mm -hmm. And it was a it was a sort of an attempt to compete with like the Tama Titan, which was the sort of standard of the industry at the time. And it was a low a low cost alternative, but yeah. it was white metal, as you said, Don. And yeah. and we would sell these things at like maybe half the price of what a Tama stand would be. Mm -hmm. But sure enough, people come back with the tilters having snapped right off. Hi hat mm -hmm. stands, the footboard would snap in half. Yeah. And 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 I remember seeing the first uh, renditions or incarnations of the Gretsch Techware, and it's in it. I think it was made at the same factory in mm -hmm. in Taiwan in those days. And um, anyway, I, I so I can totally see where you're coming from with the tilters yeah. just failing. You know, well they were awful. And I, I think Rich sold uh, and. Um, fellow down in Rhode Island there. Rich, you probably know his name. Oh, uh, Dave Aldrew's Drew. Music. Yeah. Yeah, Dave Drew, Aldrew's Music. Yeah. Dave, yeah. right, Dave right. Yeah. yeah. All those that came back, I've seen boxes and boxes of them. Some brand new, some mm -hmm. uh, some used, and all of them show wear and tear right where it's going to snap. And sure mm -hmm. enough, I mean, sitting there with, you know, JB Weld, and that just doesn't, just doesn't do it. <laughs> it just doesn't do it. I don't mind mm -hmm. repairing them, but I'd rather it not to have, not to think about it. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll never forget flying into Chicago with uh, two flight cases with about eight or 10 of those techware stands new in the box. And I brought them to Chooch and he was like, great, put them in storage. And they disappeared from wherever. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> I don't yeah. it. They're probably still in, the, in Chicago somewhere floating around that stadium. <laughs> I've seen no, there, we, there, there are there are boxes of brand new ones and yeah, and used and used as well. Yeah. Yeah. And Save Charlie everything. never wanted to change. Once he got hooked on those tech wares, nope, yeah. not changing them. Right, right. Never wanted to change. Yeah, I, that that's interesting too. That that um, I, I remember seeing those on the kit at one point, and I was surprised that he moved away from the Rogers uh, Silvermatic stuff because that he loved that stuff, and it was so good. That Rogers stuff was made so well, you know. But yeah, yeah, and that still I, held up. That's actually at the exhibition. Yeah, uh, I, I set up the exhibition for the uh, in the studio part for the stop sign badge <clears throat> kit. That's what yeah. I used over there for those. Yeah, well, you, you know the fact about those is the Rogers memory lock stands that Charlie used. He was very fortunate that tilters didn't break on those because they were just these thin little quarter twenty rods 
yeah. that would snap off. I get them all the time that they're broken, you know, and I'm amazed that Charlie didn't break any, but I don't think he really used that memory lock hardware, that, that set that you see for very long, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Not very yeah. long. Yeah. yeah. And so somewhere weird. in there, you know, he switched over between 1985 from to 1989. He still used that old Swivematic, the original hi-hat that he'd had all those years. Mm -hmm. And that hi-hat's still in the exhibition uh, setup, if I remember correctly. And when I, I met him, both sets, yeah. Yeah, when I met him, he had switched over in 1989 to the uh, to this, the memory lock version of the Swivematic mm -hmm. hi-hat stand, which had this clamp here. And yeah. that basically became his go-to hi-hat for the rest of that time and between dave drew and myself we sold him probably 20 30 40 of those hi-hats still in the boxes you know go figure I've, I've maintained all of those and 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 made sure that they're <laughs> little rubber gaskets they don't hit when you when you release the hat yeah and and just the replacing the having to replace some of the springs yeah yeah but they, they're solid. I think John Bonham used them as well. I think they're very, very solid. Yep. I, I use them in my studio. They're they're awesome. They're fantastic hi hats. They play yeah. really well. They really do. Yeah. And the clutch was the best of the best. These clutches, I see them on so many, even people who didn't use the Rogers hi hat, they would use the Swivomatic clutch because it's a great clutch. Really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was uh, that's basically what happened with the hardware. The Speed King, as everybody knows, he never stopped using Speed Kings. And I only have one story about the Speed Kings, and I looked everywhere for my photographs. But in 2002, Mike Cormier, who was a drum tech for Charlie, right after Chooch passed away. Chooch passed away in the summer of 2002. And by August, um, Mike had taken over. Mike had already been working for the Stones at that point as an assistant. And he became the drum tech for Charlie. He contacted me in August saying, you know, he was freaked out because Charlie was having a conniption because his only his favorite WFL speed king that he had had broken, the footboard had snapped in half and he was just like besides himself. So I, I went and found all my receipts because I keep everything. And I found the FedEx labels from when Mike shipped that speed king down to me in Maryland. And then I shipped it to a gentleman in Texas named Jim Petty of JP2 Creations, who was no longer with us, unfortunately. He died this year. But J Jim was able to take that, that footboard and somehow weld it back together because alloy is almost impossible to weld as don well knows you can't really glue it either you know and somehow he was able to alloy the glue of the alloy back together that footboard and shipped it back to me and then we shipped it over to uh to canada from 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 annapolis from maryland and it cut, must have cost like about three or four hundred dollars in overnight shipping fees bouncing back and forth between the, the three of us you know and uh by the time it got to charlie he'd already gotten used to the pedal that they pulled out of storage and he was playing that, and I don't know what happened to the fixed pedal, you know. But yeah, it's a fun story. You know how it it's is. Saved Don. somewhere, yeah. It's yeah, somewhere. you probably have it in a case somewhere, Don. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm betting, you know. World's most expensive speed king pedal, man. It must have cost yeah. four. Yeah. yeah, I've but, rebuilt a handful of those, and usually would have about four on hand, ready to go. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're and the the ones that he used in the last handful of years were were, were rebuilt. And making yeah. sure that they're extremely solid, um, but yeah, yeah. yeah that, I've that never seen version, the later version of the of the the link clamp, uh, the link. Oh yeah, so the, the older ones are I think uh, two and seven eighths or, yeah. or something like that, or yeah. three, and the new ones are two and seven eighths. So we yeah. made sure that the ones were the two and seven eighths were what we were using. And they were real thin, very easy yeah. to work. Amazed he got as much life as he did. Because when I got that footboard, I'd never seen a Speed King where all the lettering and all those those grooves in there were worn completely smooth. I've yeah. never seen anything like that. And all the Speed Kings I buy, and I buy hundreds of Speed Kings, I've never seen one so worn out like that. Man, it was unbelievable. Well, he, was, he was moving on that. He was, yeah. his foot was his foot was just dancing and kind of always just moving on there, mm -hmm. even if he wasn't even if he wasn't laying into the bass drum, he was just feathering yeah. like a, a lot of jazz guys do, just feather yeah. that bass drum yeah. on, on every uh, quarter note uh, or, or more. And, but he would be very powerful too at, at times, but yeah. he, he, wasn't, he wasn't always um, super heavy with his foot. He just danced and accented like a jazz player. Yeah. yeah. And he's a heel down player, if I remember correctly, both on the hi-hat and the bass drum pedal. Right? Not always. No? No, no, not always. No, 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 he, no, sometimes, 
certain songs, certain eras. Other times he'd be picking up and dancing and his feet would be up in the air. Whatever, <laughs> Fred, yeah, whatever, you know, like being the yeah. Fred, Fred Astaire of drummers. Yeah, yeah right, right. Yeah. He was a dancer. Was awesome. Yeah. I was just well, going to say, I remember him telling me we, we were talking about, of course, symbols at, at, at some time. And uh, I mean, I, but I didn't always pick his brain about symbols, but I, but I would try to. And I, and I remember him telling me something years ago about, uh, and Don, you know this full well, and I'm sure you do too, Richard, that um, at the time I didn't, he said basically every symbol he'd ever had and, and cracked, he still, what he said to me is I, I've kept them all. He yeah. said, I have them all. And I just thought, man, that would be such a treasure trove to go through. Mm. And, and, and Don, you've had that opportunity, right? To like go through a lot of his old symbols and-, and Many times, many times over and, and re-cataloging, uh, moving, moving his collection, moving his gear, uh, yeah. re-cataloging, re looking at every single piece of gear uh, that he has mm. uh, and, and, and putting him into a, into a into a year, you know, putting them into categories of certain yeah. games that he played. That, that's still ongoing. It's 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 going to take a, quite a while to, to yeah. get that together yeah. correctly. Do you, do you still have all the China type symbols, the U fit Chinas that he broke? Because he broke a million of them. Right? Yeah, yeah. He broke one per tour at least. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, every we've been touring for the past nine years. Oh, there's a that came out of where the black uh, the stop 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 sign badge black nitron kit that came out of that case uh, mm -hmm. along with a bunch of other symbols right there but uh <laughs> but the china's yeah you know we've been touring pretty heavily for the past nine years mm -hmm. uh you know five months a year um and and he'd go through quite a bit of symbols i wow. was just always put them away and always you know label them same with the drum heads label them per year and when yeah. they were removed when they were used that's cool now, Don, this symbol I, I have, I'm sharing right now, that's mm. a China or that's a ride symbol? That's a ride. That's a that's flag. A ride. Ride. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was so random with these pictures. It was like, last minute, here's a bunch of stuff, John, and take a peek. But that's a... <laughs> no, this is, uh, yeah. It's a sound creation, I think, right? Yes. Pisces Ooh, sound creation, 20 inch. Yeah. Next, and, year and I'll give you the, next year, I'll give you the picture of the top of the symbol. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be waiting for it. <laughs> a flat no, I, top isn't it it is a flat it's a 20 inch it's a, flat yeah, it's a flat. 20 inch flat okay mm -hmm. um no this is this is gold because this is the stuff that if it wasn't for you like having a peek at this stuff and you know this is the sort of mystery stuff that people wonder about you know what i mean it's it's um um and and i know i i think you sent me pictures of of like peisty chinas as well as ufip chinas that, that you found in Yes, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of feisty, uh, different feisty things. You know, I, through the years, I believe. You know, it's hard to say when people say, "Oh, he used this from this period to this period, and this this year or this this month until then." I think maybe in the photographs you see that a lot, and that's how you can kind of determine that. But all along, they did so many recording sessions and so many off gigs and rehearsals. I know with my experience with Charlie that he'd want to try different things, so. I can only imagine in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, he'd want to do the same thing and try different things, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's a big part of why maybe Sky Blue Pearl Tom showed up with the, with the Black Nitron is just, let's try it. It sounded great on the recording. Yeah. They were just down the street, you know, yeah. they were down the street recording. So why not go grab some stuff from, from the locker, you know? Yeah, I could um, totally, you know, I, I, know, I totally agree. Really, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's only a couple people really that know the, the ins and outs of what was happening in the session. Um, yeah. I've talked yeah. to Ronnie Wood quite a bit about some of the recording sessions that, that, that he was part of and, and Keith as well. It's just hard, but it's hard to get a definitive answer. Even Charlie, you know, it's hard to get yeah. uh, this yeah. is exactly what happened because they weren't thinking that in those terms. Right, exactly. Oh, they, did, they did a ton of sessions and a ton of yeah. gigs. How can you possibly remember every one Sometimes, they, yeah, sometimes they just show up and there it is and play and yeah, and they go back and, to your and life. You know what? I and I've often thought too, and I wish I had I talked to Charlie a couple of times about Jimmy Miller, but not a lot. Um, but I wish that I'd thought to ask him 
how much influence Jimmy had on his sound, like as an as a as the producer and a drummer. And I, I think Charlie would be very open and honest about saying, well, it was Jimmy's idea to use the Ludwig Tom with the, with right. the Gretsch black drums. Yeah. And right. and and I'm guessing maybe maybe Jimmy came across some of these peisty symbols in another session and said, hey, Charlie, you should try it. I, I don't know. I could be mm -hmm. totally wrong, but I think Charlie was was um, as you say, he was he was going for a sound. He wasn't yeah. going for what it said on, you know, mm -hmm. whatever the instrument was. I think he, he wanted the best sound he could get. If you think about you know, a, a phrase that comes up a lot in the studio is the studio has no eyes, you know, <laughs> so there's a lot of things that happened there that uh, some people documented and some people didn't. And there's a lot of things like that. For sure, he trusted Jimmy. I've talked to him about Jimmy Miller and he trusted his judgment a lot. Um, yeah. And, you know, sometimes Charlie wouldn't be at that session, you know, uh, for days and Jimmy Miller had to be there. So yeah. maybe the ton of gear showed up and uh, the, all speculation. Mm. There's other, there's people like, uh, there's other people that would know about some of that. Mm. I've gone yeah. through a lot of photographs from the archives. Um, mm. Need to do a lot more of that. Mm. A lot of questions get raised and then you can kind of piece them together, you know, with a photographic evidence or whatever. That, that's a good point. So, so Don, you came into the picture almost 10 years ago, I remember 2012, yeah. gearing up for the 50 and counting. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I know, you know, you and I have talked about this, but I think it'd be great for you to share with everybody what it was like for you to kind of step in at that point and with uh, a guy that we all know and love as being so um, not meticulous, but, but meticulous is a good word, but like, you know, he, he had his set way of doing things. So how was that to come in and, and, and honor that? Uh, it was amazing. I mean, I had worked with a lot of drummers before as a tech and also being a professional musician drummer, I'd come in kind of understanding what he might want to do, but it's every person you work with is, is a new venture. It's a new, uh, new situation. So a lot of admiration for Charlie early on. And I had done some research, but you know, <laughs> about who he is and as a player, uh, but also just taking it uh, fresh, a fresh set of ears, fresh set of eyes. You know, what can I learn on the spot today and not think about what happened in 72 or whatever. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was pretty amazing to see what he did and how he played, but then, to start talking with him about vintage drums, which I had had a passion with for several years, and my dad is my dad has as well. Um, to start talking to him about that kind of uh, aspect of drumming was amazing. So he picked up on that I was a drum geek, and I picked up on he was a drum geek, <laughs> and we were off off and running for years. You know, I mean, for half the year of per year for for nine years straight, we were just um, talking about drums. Um, yeah. and he didn't want to get bored with what he was using at, at the time or what he's using now, but he was, he was really interested in what was, what the possibilities were, what the possibilities were for maybe his jazz setup. He was talk talking a lot about, let's try something different for a jazz setup. Mm -hmm. And we'd go and do a, a little sit-in or something with Tim Reese and those guys and let's try this. Let's bring this down to the gig. Let's try this snare. Let's try, you know, mm -hmm. so that kind of stuff happened a lot. Wow. Um, and different things came into the picture throughout the years that I worked with him every year. He had me restore a lot of drums, all of his stones gear for the exhibition and also the blonde kit for the stage. Um, That's huge. He, trust, right he trusted me to do those things because I'm a custom furniture builder and a drum restoration guy. So yeah, it, I didn't try to convince him to do these things. He just took interest in me and I had major interest in him, you know? Um, so it was admiration. And, and I, I think he trusted in me that I do the best I could. Um, and I always use the word with him preservation instead of yeah. restoration. And yeah, I, I think he liked the idea of that. Uh, mm. He didn't want to change anything. He wanted to just maintain what was happening. Um, yeah. So it was incredible. It, it really yeah. was incredible. And like I said before, it's going to take a lifetime to understand everything he's taught me. 
you know, about everything, about drumming, about, you know, everything, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's heavy. That's so. I heavy. don't know if that answers the question. I don't know. No, it absolutely does. And I and I just want to add to that that it's that I, I think you're being humble because he he trusted you so much. I mean, um, I, I certainly got that when I'd be around you guys. I mean, it you you would have thought I. I mean, I, I remember meeting you that first time in 2012, and you you would you know you had just stepped in, and then a couple of well, I guess six months later, I saw you in Boston. And it was like you'd had the gig for 10 years. And then a couple of years later, it was like you'd been there forever. It really was. I mean, it was there was yeah. just so much of a connection between you guys and so much trust. And, and just like you said, the fact that he let you preserve his blonde Gretsch kit, which is like, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. huge. That's it, it really needed it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. He knew it. <laughs> he knew it. I mean... Yeah, I'm, I'm a little adamant about that. I'm like, wow, look at the bearing edges. They're just, they're torn mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Uh, and all of the drums, quite honestly, were, were that way because they take the bottom rims off for recording sessions or, or, or who yeah. knows how it all came together. But they all, the blonde kit, was, the edges were really, really chewed up on the bottom and the top, actually. Um, so I had to, uh, I think I sent you some pictures on that, John. I'm not sure if that's. Yeah, yep. I'm, I'm looking if you want to take a look at those, but uh, the floor tom in particular was really chewed up, the top bearing edge, the bottom bearing edge. So uh, as a woodworker, I filled it in um, with some three-part epoxy that we have used a lot for furniture restoration. Um, and it, it has a property, so it still sustains like wood and actually is wood, sculpt wood, it's called. Mm -hmm. And instead of cutting the edges on a, on a, a router, um, I have a sanding, I have sanding blocks for different edges and 30 degree round over, I would just sand it out. My friend, Joe Montaneri helped me, uh, trusted in him to actually cut on the, rotor, on the router for the bass drum, the front mm -hmm. edge of the bass drum rim, uh, bearing edge, sorry. Uh, he came in and assisted me on that. And, um, just, you know, got them back to where they really are gonna, have a wide tuning range and, and will sustain throughout a night. And he loved it. He absolutely loved it. Um, took all the lugs off, packed them with felt, made sure all the springs were operational. Um, and uh, yeah, just really kept them going. You know? Yeah, man. We had a question and this, this is, this leads up to, I think for, for a great question for you, Don, um, Anthony Cusina was asking what type of heads did Charlie prefer using on all his drums? And, uh, and, you know, and I'll just say, you know, most people know that he played the black dot heads, the, the Remo control sound heads for many, many years. I, by my recollection from about 75 on, he was using the black dots, even on the, on the black nitron set before he got to the blonde set. But then fast forward to Don McCauley's influence, 2019, mm -hmm. What happens? Well, he, it, it was more so I brought a, another drum in. I brought another floor tom in with a coated ambassador head like he had done in the early 70s as an extra floor and another bass drum doing the same thing. And he says, well, let's try that on these drums because we're going into the studio. And he said, let's try the, the coated ambassadors. Um, it went into Henson Studios to record some stuff. And he... I said, sure, let's go for it. I kept the same exact black dots that we had on the, there <laughs> to make sure we could put them right back on. Uh, we used them in the studio. He loved them. I, I suspected we're going to switch back for the tour coming up. He says, no, let's leave them on for the tour. <laughs> and I says, okay, it's up to you. Of course, it's your thing. And they sound wonderful. But he yeah. said, there's my floor tom. My floor tom is back. That was mm -hmm. his, that was his, you know, answer to that was, there's the floor tom. It's it's got all the the note, the, all the tone that I want again, um, and he loved it. You know, there's nothing like the 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 coated um, the uh, the black dots for projection. They sound great in a stadium. They really project. <clears throat> but coming from a studio to go into it into a, a live show, you know, they sound they both sound great. Yeah, yeah. They. I mean, I saw you that tour, and they they sounded so great. They. And you could hear, I mean, even with all the 
the processing and, you know, drums in a big stadium, you can get any drum to sound really great. Yeah, but there's none of that. Not with us. Uh, well, Dave, that Natal, it, yeah. Dave Natal, who is a front house engineer, uh, is a drummer and he'll have none of that. There's no, there's barely any limiting and there's no gating. There's nothing. It's what we put into the microphone is what you hear out front. Okay. And that's, yep. that's very powerful. So you do hear the difference in the, in the heads. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you 2019 do. tour, you hear the sound differently than you do 2018 tour. Yeah. And Anthony asked about the, uh, the resonance side and those were clear ambassadors. They were starting in 2012. Okay. Actually. And Natal, Dave Natal had a lot to do with that. He said, I want a little more sustain in the drums. So they took off the black dots on the bottom. Right. But he's like, that's what Tony Williams did. Why would we want to change it? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's always about what, what another jazz drummer has done. You know, I want to do what he. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I know. I know. Can't go wrong, you know, when you copy Tony's head setup, I mean, that's, yeah. that's okay, but. Sure, man. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great, outstanding. Uh, and, and Rich, you, you talked about, last time, you know, we talked about the whole uh, UFIP, China, that, you know, the China thing continues to be such a um, interesting subject for people, you know, like when he started using it, um, you know, I, I know there's uh, Todd, Todd Little, who's on the Facebook appreciation page, who might be watching this right now. I don't, I'm looking to see, I don't see him here, but he could be watching. Uh, we've talked about at different times about Charlie using a Peisty China. Mm -hmm. And my guess is it might have, it might have been during when the time you were selling them UFIP Chinas, or maybe before that, but before, yeah. Before. Okay. And I speculate that maybe speculated that maybe they were in Europe and he had cracked the UFIP and couldn't get a replacement. And Chooch might have gone out and bought a Peisty somewhere at a, at a drum shop, you know, which were, they were plentiful in those yeah. days, but. Um, yeah, this know, is you've got some... from the previous episode that I supplied to you that shows Charlie playing the maple kit with the Rogers hardware. And there's a uh, pasty China type right where their UFIPs are now, you know, I believe yeah. the chicken yeah. came before the egg on that one. I think he used the pasties first, like what they did, but then he heard the UFIPs and liked them better. I think that's what happened. That's my theory anyways. I don't know that for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. I just, I remember seeing, I know that the, the first time I saw him using one um, in 78 on the some girls tour, mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what it was until I saw, finally saw a photo, a sort of close up photo and, and, it, and it was a UFIP, but it doesn't mean that he didn't use the Peisty before it. And then, yeah. yeah, yeah. Who knows, but who knows what, uh, what happened or how they got switched over from one to the other. Yeah. Yeah. When I met him in 1989, he was thoroughly using the UFIP from that point on. I never saw him ever deviate from that. Never saw him change. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah the, the, weights, the weights on those symbols have stayed the same relatively. Um, the weights that we would order from uh, Alberto mm -hmm. at UFIP were about 1,300 grams. And I think the older ones that I saw, I weighed those as well. I weighed all the, the series of symbols even back to the sky blue pearl kit stuff that went with those. Mm -hmm. But the, but the UFIPs were roughly around 1200 to 1300 grams each yeah. one of them throughout the, all of those years. So okay. it, he liked that sound and I'm not sure about the Pisces. I haven't weighed those um, or done sound files on them to match them up, but it, 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 they're very similar, but the UFIPs have just a different sound. You know? Yeah, different sound. yeah different. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that, that explains it, Don, because I think uh, you're right. I think, you know, knowing how that works, that if you can get in that same range, yes. you're going to get pretty close sound wise. Yeah, relatively. Yeah. 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 In the studio, I think he would go for a little lighter symbol and then mm. on the shows, it'd be a little heavier. Yeah. 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 Well, that was one of the jobs that was given to me by Chooch. Is he asked me, he says, you know, Rich, we need another China type. The one that Charlie's got, it's broken, you know? And so when I met him in 1989, like I said, not longer after I met him and we delivered that drum, I started to get more and more job, uh, little tasks to be given to me by Chooch. And he would have me order one symbol at a time from UFIT. And we never specified anything other than it was an 18 inch Chinese type. And uh, we would pretty much get the same symbol every time. And it would cost him like $500 a symbol to get them. And we had to wait and get customs and 
pay taxes on them and was uh, it was crazy. That's one of them right there, you know. That one's broken, as you can see, as they all are probably. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. We went for a number of years like that, uh, buying one at a time those symbols. And finally, you know, I was like, Charlie, I mean, when I went to Chooch, I said, Chooch, this is crazy, man. You can get these things for free, you know. And at that time, I, um, I, this was about 1994, just before the uh, Voodoo Lounge tour. I, I called up the uh, gentleman. I had just by chance met this guy named Alex, who was the, um, the director of a company that was taking over the distribution of UFIP. And he had bought some blue Vistalite Ludwigs from me. And, he's, and he had on his letterhead, you know, president of distribution and we do UFIP. And I'm, oh, great. So I, I uh, faxed him at that time. That's back in the days of fax. And I said, hey, can we get some kind of like limited endorsement of UFIPs for Charlie? And uh, he was like, no problem. Great. You know, so uh, we put together an order of symbols and they sent like 60 of those Chinese symbols. Uh, they arrived uh, in Washington, D.C. at the JRFK Stadium where they're rehearsing in uh, August of 1994. And they sent a whole pile of them. And this is one of those symbols uh, that I have today. And um, they went through all those symbols and the only Charlie only picked out two of them and we really weren't specifying what kind of weight or whatever so they got all kinds of different ones they got some of the ones that kind of had that burnished what they call natural sound look mm -hmm. and then the other ones were your typical like a azilgen just a standard brass look you know and he just picked out two of them and got, he said I don't want the rest of them you know and I was a, I was a, as a gift for putting this all together I was given this one and then the one behind me up on the wall which is signed by Charlie you know and from that point on, he was had a silent endorsement with you as he did right up till this year. And, you know, mm -hmm. and Don was able to, I think when Don came on, he was able to specify the weight and the size and the type of symbol they got. Because prior to that, we were just getting whatever the natural sounds or the nat, you know, some had rivets like this one and some were just the plain and he would just use whatever, you know. And uh, one of the things that happened at that 1994, when we got, those UFIPs, uh, he had one of the natural sound symbols and it had a big chunk broken out of it. And so we had it, uh, down, there's a uh, metal shop here in Annapolis and we took that symbol down and cut the cut, the, cut the, uh, the, the, the break out of it and put like a U-shaped cut into it. And Charlie used it for like another week and then it just fell apart. You know? <laughs> yeah. Somewhere in Don's collection, you're gonna see that one with a kind of a big U in it, you know? And it's a yeah. natural sound one with the brown looking symbols. <laughs> he so, sounds good. Yeah. yeah, he's yeah he's talked about how, you know, like how the, he he used to say to me, you know, I almost like defending his position for not wanting to try a Zildjian china. He'd say, you know, the UFIPs have the sound or something. He'd say, but they do split. You know, I they they yeah. I split them pretty quick. He said, and I can only drill them so much. You know, and then they're and then they're gone. Yeah, uh, and I you know, and I would always tell him like, look, I'm I'm not trying to. I'm, I'm just trying to offer if, if, if we ever landed on one that you liked and Don, you know, to your expertise, like if we had landed on one that was, that was a certain gram weight, I, you know, I, I would have then said, you know, we can, we can get you a quantity of these or something, but I never mm -hmm. wanted to ever, you know, I, I respected that he, I think part of it was he, he looked up and, and saw that symbol that he knew and, and mm -hmm. recognized and that that's was, it. Made, yeah. He was comfortable with it. And exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's the sound that he has. And, and he's, he, uh, is why change? What's the reason to change? It sounds great, but Zildjian's sound fantastic on the hats. They sound great on the 16 inch crash. And yeah, uh, yeah they, each one has its own placement. I think, I think that's a big part of it right there. I think one of the reasons they broke also is because he played them like this, instead of how a lot of guys put them upside down, he always played them like this. And it puts a lot of pressure on the edge there. And I think it's, it, it destroyed, well, not destroyed, but it's easier to crack that way, you know? And, and you know, and, and also you're right. And I, and I think just at, from a background of working in a cymbal company, and I used to tell people this all the time that played Chinese cymbals, the edge itself, there, there's a stress point on there to, you know, as, as you point out, Richard, that that's sort of a natural stress point for a cymbal to crack. But when you play it as much as Charlie did, Right. Um, which he did. He played it really as his main crash, and it often as a ride symbol too. You see him playing the groove yep. on that thing, you know, eighth note riding, yeah. and uh, and sometimes he'd play it like a like a jazzer, and sometimes he'd whack the shit out of it, you know. Yeah. And so you, yeah. you could 
you can understand why. <laughs> yeah, he didn't hold yeah, back. I he get it. He was a powerful. He was a powerful hitter. If he mm-hmm, wanted yeah. to, he he had nice del- delicate touch, but he could certainly lay in if he wanted to. And uh, yeah, his UFIP over to the side, to his stage right side, um, is a swish, and that was what he called the crowd roar. You know, <laughs> he wouldn't really crash on that. He would just ride on it. And that was much more of, that was where the, what he called the crowd war. It was much more yeah. of a symbol. Yeah. Hey, hey, Don, can you talk a little bit about the, the legendary flat ride that 18-inch Italian mm-hmm. yeah. flat rides? The B8, B8 material. Um, B8 material, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And for years, you know, everybody's been trying to figure out what it is. And as you know, there was a, there is uh, a crack. It's about three quarters long from the center hole out. And I've marked where it, where I, when I first came on in 2012 and to see if it had, you know, carried, traveled it on, it hasn't. Um, the only time you really hear that crack is when you, Moonlight Mile, he'll play the, the mallets. And that's when you would have heard that rumble, a little bit of yeah. a distressing metals uh, together. We talked about getting it fixed, but I, I was way against it because it's going to change the sound. You can braise it and all that, but it's going to change the sound. He, he found that, as we know, in 78 mm. in Paris with Chooch. And he was just yeah. coming out of a session with, uh, with him. And they were walking through the streets of Paris out of uh, Pathé Marconi. And they went over to the um, uh, Battery uh, drum shop. Le- yeah. Is that how you pronounce it? I forgot. Yeah, I went there. Yeah. Yeah. And I went there and I mm. talked to the owner and, and tried to retrace those steps and uh, <laughs> see if I could find some kind of receipt. Uh, or any knowledge at all and the guy that I talked to was the owner and he remembers the day that it was purchased wow. yeah and uh, I said so what was it what kind of symbol was it and at that point I'd already seen uh, our, our lighting director had put different colored lights on the symbol I had had them put all sorts of different colors in there throughout the whole spectrum of their their light spectrum and it was a certain kind of greenish amber color would reflect what we saw was called the golden bell. And mm-hmm. it's a round emblem. And it just barely came through round. It said golden bell, um, uh, 18 flat, or 17.56 or something like that. Flat ride um, mm-hmm. in red markings. So we started retracing that. And who's going to find you? Know, who's going to tell me? what the golden bell was. We couldn't find anything about golden bell. Mm. Went through everybody at UFIP. Nobody could come up with anything in their, in their um, old history. I uh, started talking to a couple other people and we've determined that uh, it was a, a, a Tosca, that it was a Tosca, that it was a cheaper made symbol. Yeah. And that's what it is. Um, there's a guy named Luca, Luca Luciano, an Italian guy mm-hmm. who, you know, he, kind of really gets into the Italian symbols. Uh, he helped kind of determine that quite a bit. I went, mm. I had, uh, I went through a lot of different channels to find out. And that's what we've, we've seen. We still haven't seen the logo materialize anywhere, the Golden Bell logo. Mm. But that was determined that it was a Tosca because um, that style of symbol, the weight, I've actually had it scanned um, on the, on the, the best um, 3D scanner you can get. Mm-hmm. We've got the weights of it. We've got photos of, you know, images of the exact grooves, everything. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a, it's a Tosca. Yeah, and it, and it is, as Charlie has said, it's a one-off too, you know, it's-, it's Yeah, it really is. And, and they did- a million nice, of them. Yeah, yeah. But, and they, they did make nice symbols, you know, Tosco, they, they were, yeah. you know, one of the respected uh, Italian companies and- Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of known for, for like lower price B8 type stuff, yep. but, but made some really nice symbols. I had uh, Roberto Spizzicino's uh, son and his widow come out in Italy, as, as well as uh, Alberto uh, from UFIP, to just kind of see if any of them knew anything about it. And uh, if Roberto might have done something because he worked for a lot of different companies um, and they, they had no recollection of uh, mm-hmm. the Golden Bell. Chased, yeah, I've chased down a lot of, a lot of theories. Yeah, yeah. Boy, he, yeah, he he was such a man of mystery when it came to that stuff. You know, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
but it was supposedly it was in the used bin at the right store. Yep. yeah yeah he, he didn't like old he didn't like new shoes and he didn't like new symbols so. hmm. I, I i just I, I know i love that story how he, he found it him and huge found it secondhand yeah you know and yeah yeah bombed out of their heads as he said that's exactly <laughs> it yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're on a break oh, from the tattoo, and those guys are, you know, overdubbing or something. Like, let's get out of here. Let's go for a walk. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what he told uh, me. Anyways. Yeah. That's so great. That's so great. Oh man. Well, you know, I I I want to have you guys tell some more um, stories. Maybe just a Richard. You know, like share share some more stories about yeah working with Chooch and Charlie and and uh, this is so great. Well, uh, probably the next thing that happened uh, after I first met them in 1989, uh, they finished the Steel Wheels tour, which went on forever. I mean, it just kept coming back and went to Europe and then back to America. It went on for like two years. And when they finally finished uh, in 1992, Charlie wanted to jump back into his favorite thing to do, which is the jazz, his jazz trios, his jazz tentets, his jazz orchestra. And uh, if we go back to 1986, he had this thing that he did with Charlie Watts Orchestra. And yep. um, this was an, ex I, I wouldn't call it an experiment. It was just something he was dying to do. You know, he just loved jazz and he wanted to play jazz in a big band. And the Charlie Watts Orchestra was a big ass band, you know, and they had a horn section and strings and you name it. They had everything in there. And uh, if you look in this, uh, this tour program, I got, I was given to this by Chooch. There's some little pictures of the, they had three drummers in the band, first of all, yeah. which is kind of crazy. But Charlie's playing like a kind of a hodgepodge of what looks like either a Heyman or a, or a Camco bass drum, and then his 8x12, and, uh, and then some kind of um, a Chinese uh, symbol on a rivet, you know, and stuff. And uh, so he would do these projects from time to time. And uh, a lot of times he would just throw together a drum set and, and play. And uh, when I made him, met him in 1989, um, 1992 rolled around and they were finally off and done. They were like, okay, we're gonna do another show, another album. And then they came out with this, uh, this is tribute to Charlie Parker with strings. They came out with this album. And then if you look at the cover of this, it's got a picture of uh, Charlie's playing, the, uh, sitting there with a saxophone and a Pearl drum set, God forbid, yeah. you know? <laughs> I and remember, uh, yeah yeah it's crazy and he was they were actually renting that pearl kit not only for the photographs but for the shows when i went to see him you know and i ended up at the um 1992 at the blue note uh restaurant in new york city and they were playing there and he was using this you know rental drum kit you know and it was just it just was not I, you know he just wasn't loving it you know i mean he just did he was loving playing with the band but he was not loving the kit you know and so uh and I think originally when I first met him, I told you about the Green Sparkle kit that I supplied for him. I originally think that he wanted to use that for the jazz project, but that was just not going to work because it, it had a 22 inch bass drum, which was much too big for what his heroes played. You know, Charlie was a big fan of Elvin Bishop, I mean, Elvin Bishop, Elvin Jones and uh, Tony Williams and guys like that. And they all had little 18 inch bass drums and that's what he wanted, you know? So what he did is he, um, Chooch contact me and says, okay, we need to find a Gretsch jazz, jazz drum set. So uh, a good friend of mine, Tommy Taylor, who plays with the Eric Johnson band, and at that time was still playing with uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Cross. Oh, sure, and Tommy Taylor. Tommy yeah. is a big, big collector from down in Austin, Texas. Yeah. And we, we would deal, do a lot of horse trading. He would buy drums from me, and I'd buy drums from him. And I remember a couple of months earlier, he said, oh, I've got this old uh, Gretsch drum set with an 18-inch bass drum. I picked it up on the road, like in North Carolina. And uh, I was like, oh, man, that'd be perfect. So we made a deal, and he shipped it up to me. And then um, I shipped it up to a guy in Canada named Seppo Salmonen. And uh, Seppo has a company called TRS Drum Company. And uh, I supplied you with some pictures earlier of Seppo with that drum kit. And when they got the drum kit, they took it to Charlie. And... Uh, the kit was pretty beat up. It, it had like the, the floor tom had uh, breaks in a pearl and it had uh, extra holes on the bass drum and extra had Rogers mounts on there. And Charlie uh, was just not really crazy about the way it looked, you know? 
So, uh, so I shipped it with the Seppo and Seppo rewrapped it in brand new black nitron and redid the hoops, filled in the holes for the garages hardware and put the, uh, put the drums back together. And then he got to deliver them. And that picture of his is of Seppo at the uh, Toronto, um, the, um, on Young Street, there's a place called the Crescent School and he delivered it to rehearsal there. And this would be about 1994 when this happened by the time it all came together. Uh, and so uh, Charlie got the drums, that, but that was right around the time they were rehearsing for Voodoo Lounge. And that's what you're seeing there is behind the, the rehearsal room in the back room at, at the Voodoo Lounge rehearsal hall. That's Seppo. Uh, and you can see he's got the, the Swivel Medic hi-hat. He's got the yeah. Hercules uh, snare stand. He's got one of the Gretsch Techware stands. And I think he has one of the, either the Zildjian's or the UFIPs up on the ride symbol there. And, uh, and Charlie's, you know, got to check it out. And uh, that set basically came with a 14 by 18 bass drum, an eight by 12 ride tom, a 14 by 14 floor, and a 16 by 16 floor, plus a matching five and a half by 14 name band snare drum, all in round badge. And once Charlie got yeah. that set, he used that for quite a while. And then, like John said, later on um, in, the, in the early 2010, 12, whatever that was, he started using different drum kits for his jazz projects. And I know that Steve Maxwell supplied him with an identical kit, but it was a newer Gretsch classic or made in USA uh, series kit that was in the same finish. Right. So, yeah. Yep. And so when, when you look at the, um, the flyer for the, this is from the Blue Note. This is the flyer that they used for the Charlie Watts Tentet from the Blue Note and also when they performed at the Ronnie Scott's in London, they used the same uh, flyer here. And uh, not too long after that, they did an article uh, on Rhythm Magazine and, uh, and he's featured in this magazine with that black drum set after it's been all nice and clean and polished and, and re refinished and, and he used that for quite some time. So I was really happy to be part of that. But again, I didn't do any of the actual recovering. All I did was I located the set brought it to Maryland, shipped it up to Toronto, had Seppo work on it. So when I asked Charlie about it not too long ago, um, he basically thought that Seppo had brought him the kit. He said, oh, I got that from some guy in Canada. I said, well, actually, you got that from me through Chew <laughs> from Tommy Taylor. And uh, Seppo did all work. So when Seppo delivered it, Charlie associated the, the purchase of that kit with Seppo, thinking that Seppo had got it. But Seppo had done a magical, wonderful job of refinishing that kit. And that's still in the collection today, you know. So I'm really, really glad to, to see that that's still being used. And you'll see it in all kinds of the different Charlie Watts uh, CDs that came out, the Ten Tet CD. Uh, all these CDs have uh, Charlie playing the Black Kit for many years. And then more recently, when he did the shows at the Iridium, and then he did, did some shows at Ronnie Scott's. Those were all with different kits uh, that. Uh, that either Steve Maxwell or Don was able to put together for him. I don't think he really used that, that kit anymore, but he, I know he was really happy with it when he got it. He was just had a big smile on his face. With that kit, actually that little, that little black kit, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's very little space to set up anything within mm -hmm. his uh, room. So to say mm -hmm. the locker. And uh, that's the only kit that I set up just so he could, could play around a little bit. You know, that's the, that's the one we set up for that. And it sounds great. I pitched it up really high so you can just have fun with it. Very different than what yeah. he would have on a rock and roll setup. More of a uh, jazz tuning. Yeah. 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 It's exactly. Yeah. It, and uh, yeah, it was, he's like, well, I don't have my, I don't have the proper suit to play that kit. <laughs> but he sat down anyways and played it. You know? It's a, it's a really great sounding kit. Right there. This it's is the suit for that kit, by the way, on the yes. cover of the magazine. This is the suit that he had custom made right. to play. Exactly. But he's very particular. If he was playing that kit, he had to be wearing this suit, you know? So I thought that was pretty interesting. That's a picture of the drum set before it was recovered when it was still at my house. Yeah. And you can see they're scratched up and pretty chewed up. Great sounding, yeah. but yeah. in need of a lot of love, you know? They were pretty it's messed cool up. Set. Yeah, it's a very cool set. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna find that picture again um, of Seppo sitting behind it because- Oh yeah. At closer inspection, and mm -hmm. I can find it in my- um, in my shared photos. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Well, I may and have Charlie, to find you. Charlie went back to using a snare stand to hold the Tom Tom because originally when we uh, redid it, I don't know if it had a, a, a clip mount on it. I don't know if that got put back on it at some other point, 
but you can see it in this picture, the real constant clip mounts there on the bass drum. I don't know if that was put back on because uh, he generally liked to use the setup with a snare stand. I don't believe it. it. Yeah, I don't believe it is. I think it's just yeah. just the bass drum. It's um, yeah, the, the picture of the Tentet cover. You can see the snare stand, those Hercules uh, or uh, Buck Rogers snare stands being used. Yeah, there's Seppo. Yeah. So you know what I'm thinking? Looking at that ride symbol, mm -hmm. when I saw Charlie um, in '97 on the B kit, he was using a Canadian K Zildjian ride symbol. Mm -hmm. that looked like it was from the 70s mm -hmm. um and i it was either a 20 or a 22 i think it was a 20 and that you know i could be totally wrong but that the shape of that the flat profile of that ride yeah. symbol um it could be the angle but that looks like a, a mm -hmm. k zildjian like a, a, a more modern uh not a zildjian usa but a canadian k yep I more like that. the old turkish ones yeah you can sort of tell by the color of the symbol too the way it yeah yep like yeah. And, you know, it would make sense. I mean, he, he could have picked it up while he was there in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, they were, you know, they were still kind of around at that time. Um, yeah, very interesting to see this yeah. and, and hear the history of how that, you know, I've, I've seen this, this kit, Richard, a million times in different photos, yeah. and it's really cool to hear the backstory on it. Yeah. Well, thank God for Tommy, because he came up with it. I was like, where am I going to find the Gritch Cube with an 18 inch space drum? And I had just talked to Tommy a few months before about that. And he was like, I got this kit. And I was like, ah. <laughs> so it just kind of all worked out. It all came together. Yeah, there it is. That's... Wow. Very, very cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going to see if there's any. To, to the B stage. Are you ready for that yet? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right. Is there any questions? We'll, we'll keep, yeah, we'll keep on pressing on. All right. Yeah, because uh, the, the B stage was a whole other story. Again, uh, Chooch calling me up in, um, um, I think it was April or May of 1997. And I thought every time we'd finish a tour, a different supplying a drum set or whatever, I thought, okay, I'm done. They've gotten everything they've ever possibly could need from me. What else could they need? And when they called up, when Chooch called never up, never ending. It's never ending, Rich. Never ending. We're yeah, going to keep calling. Something. We're going to keep calling you. Yeah. <laughs> I was very glad. I was always yeah. like, whenever he would call, I was like, yes, all right, you know. <laughs> um, he would call up uh, about this. Uh, he called me up, and originally in, in May, he said, oh, we need to find like a vintage drum set, Gretsch, like with a 22, you know, 13, 16, and like an anniversary sparkle. That's what he had his mind set on. And uh, we looked around, couldn't find any. And after a while, I found a couple of different candidates and sent pictures up to Chooch. And by that time, this was probably June or July or something like that of 1997, they had changed their, they kept on changing, you know, and then they had landed on the idea of getting the kit, basically a replica of the maple kit that, he, that he's famous for using. He says, yeah, we want to get a, a rep, the same kit, same size, the same vintage round badge. And I was like, oh boy, we're going to do another refinish job here, you know, so. Um, and then what happened is that uh, we had to find, you know, the drums and the shells and, and find the right people to get all the work done. Because by this point, I wasn't using Ward Wilson anymore because he, he'd stopped working. He'd gone on to a different profession. And he wasn't restoring drums. So um, I was able to call up my friend Steve Bedalamit, who lives in Detroit, and, um, and get, get him to do the, the finish work. And so the shells were found for us by a guy named Blair Holden. Blair found a 22, a 12, and a 16, all six-ply round bad shells that were in good condition. They had extra holes from this, the rail consulates and stuff. And we shipped them over to Jack Lawton over in Pennsylvania, at Sunbury, Pennsylvania, the Lawton Drum Company. And Jack basically stripped and sanded the drums, plugged all the holes on the bass drum and the tom-toms, because we were, we were definitely going to go for a mounted tom on a snare stand. We were not going to have any mounts on the bass drum for anything else. And so, uh, and then once Jack was finished preparing the drums and plugging the holes, he shipped them to Steve. Steve had a professional paint shop, uh, do the shells in like a clear maple finish. And then uh, we were we were basically given the task of delivering them. So I, I drew, uh, flew out to Detroit in September. And this all came together in a very short period of time over just a couple of weeks to get everything finally, when we finally got the go ahead to go, the green light to do this job. It all, all came together in about two or three weeks. It was a really fast kind of a rush job because they were doing rehearsals in Mon and, uh, in Toyota, um, Toyota uh, Toronto 
Toronto, yeah. In uh, September, you know, and they were like, we need the drums for Toronto. We're going to do the B stage. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. And Steve, my God, he was able to pull it off, man. Steve Badalman, I got to hand it to him, man. He put it all together. And uh, we, we, we wanted to make sure we had the right heads on there, the right rims. We got the black dots. But one of the things that we couldn't find was at that time, Charlie was using a clear 22 inch and um, uh, Evans hydraulic head on the batter side of that bass drum. And he, you know, Chooch was, we got to have the hydraulic head, you know, I'm like, and it was the first version of it with the white collar. I'm like, my God, yeah. where are we going to find this thing? And somebody in, in my friend's neighborhood that was throwing away a Ludwig Blue Vistalite kit. And on that kit, the 22 inch base, it had the clear Vistalite, I mean, the clear Evans drum head on it, but it was covered in duct tape all over it, up and down and top to bottom. I was like, oh my God. But I could see when I flipped it on the backside that the head was perfectly intact. I don't know why they put the stuff on. You know, this is, goes back to the 70s when it people was, were- It was crossed. probably ringing too much. Yeah, right. <laughs> so they ate the crap out of it. It had duct tape everywhere. So I spent like a whole day, you know, getting the duct tape off and then using a, a remover. And I got it so it looked brand new, man. It still had the hydraulic uh, logo on it. So we were like, right. And so I shipped that up to Steve. He put it on the drum head. And then we hopped in his, his uh, car and we drove up to, uh, from Detroit over the bridge to Windsor, Ontario, uh, into um, uh, Toronto to the uh, Crescent School, which was on Yonge Street. And, uh, and we were ushered in. There was all these people around there trying to get in. They wanted to hear the Stones and the Stones were rehearsing in there. And we were ushered into this room where this, it was just basically the the, the, st the five stones and a couple of the backup singers and um, and one or two guitar techs, you know, Kira was there, Chooch was there, and one or one other guy was there. And the stones were practicing all their songs. So we set the drums up in a side room. Charlie came out of the rehearsal hall. That same side room that you saw Seppo, we went mm -hmm. into that side room. It was Charlie's storage area. And so yeah. we brought the drums, set them all up there, and, and he had some stands and pedals and Charlie sat down and started playing them. He just absolutely loved them. He was really happy for that. And, uh, and a lot of people got to see the band in a new way because you had the main stage, which had the vintage Gretsch kit. And now you had this B stage out in the middle of the auditorium with the B stage kit, which was an identical replica. And it was just such a, an amazing thing. And then we were invited next day to go to the uh, Air Canada. They had a massive airplane hangar where they had set up the entire stage of the stones with all the equipment overnight. They had brought all the equipment over from rehearsal, set it all up there with all the PA and the lights and the bombs. And uh, they had set up the B stage and it was on a hydraulic riser. It would come up with all the equipment on there. And so we got to watch them practice with the B stage. And that was the first time that drum set got set up, tuned, microphoned and, and ready to go. And it was just such a, a real uh, exciting time to be there, you know, to actually get to witness oh, all this yeah. guests, you know, and, and to be such a big part of that. Absolutely. Yeah. That must have been a thrill. I, I remember seeing that kit and my, mm. my mind being blown because it was such a close replica. I mean, yeah, you know, Don, you know, Charlie's main kit intimately. You can't, you can't replicate those, no. you know, those, those uh, battle scars that, are all over Charlie's main kit, but but that replica kit was amazing to look at. Like it was just so spot on. Well, so the lacquer finish, that's where you, that's where it really comes in. I think with the B stage mm. kit, the lacquer finish is a little bit of a tint of kind of a amber orange color. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to get it. Like you say, Rich, you had a very short period of time to work and get mm. that kit ready. I, I know. Mm. Heard some intimate stories about that, but <laughs> it, it was quick. And you, to get that distressed finish from a, uh, a late 50s kit, mm. yeah. nearly impossible. So it was a great job. You guys did a great, great job at it. Thank great you. Job. Look wonderful. How does yeah. that kit compare to the main kit, the sound, sound, sound wise? I've never had Very it different. side by side. Very different. Very That's different. What I thought. They yeah. both sound great. They both sound excellent. But the B stage kit has its own thing. Well, it's a 13, 13, 16, 22, where his is a 12, 16, 22. Yeah. Oh, I thought yeah. we had put a 12 for that kit, for uh, the B stage kit. Pretty sure it's a 13. I think it's like 13. It? But, yeah. but it sounds great. I've used it. We've had it uh, at a backstage rehearsal for one one run. Um, and it sounds good. It sounds really good. The bass drum sounds actually really fantastic on that one. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I've seen some pictures of them recording in the studio where they brought that kit in for some recording sessions. And it's also been used in as a, a second. 
as a secondary recording. Yeah. 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 For, for a different setup, different tuning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like they did on the Buddha Lounge tour. They would have the main kit already mic'd up and EQ'd. Yep. So when they wanted to do something different, when they set up in the hallway at the, for the Buddha Lounge album, they set up the uh, that bass drum, that uh, my first piece of business, and they set up right. like a, one of Charlie's backup snare drums. You know, very so. different sound, very different mic technique, everything about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to have a lot of tools on hand. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Hey Don, our friend Brian County is watching right now. He's, oh hey, he's Brian. Enjoying this. Hey man. Shout out to our friend Brian, local local guy here. Local drummer, local local fan. Yeah, yeah. good guy. And uh, and have a question for Don from uh, Anthony Om Omodio who's asking if you can maybe just talk a little bit about the, the tech process for setting up Charlie's drums, like as far as um, how Charlie would like to have his gear to be set up, tape on the carpet, uh, Sharpie on the stands, mm -hmm. what, what tricks of the trade you might have uh, implored to do that? What he would like to do and then what, you know, uh, the things that he, he, he wanted to make sure of is that everything was uh, angled properly. The way he wanted it properly and mm -hmm. uh you know early on in the 70s he had his rack tom facing kind of like what steve jordan is doing now where it, it, the angle of the rack tom is facing stage right you know yeah upstage yeah. right and you're kind of going backwards where he had his what he wanted later on was that his 12 inch rack tom was really facing straight at him uh i think that was because he did so many hits on the rack tom rim and the floor tom rim but it wasn't always hitting in the center of the drum he was always he kind of like bounced off of the rim a lot so mm -hmm. the rim of the rack tom was very very important and to make sure in the basket that it was sitting in it wasn't getting choked it wasn't getting closed up so that it had a lot of sustain, right. tons of sustain and uh yeah. with the floor tom the same thing it, he thought it, it it didn't ring enough we don't put any muting on whatsoever there's no mm -hmm. those gels or any gaff tape there's nothing there like that it's all wide open so that it rings as much as possible and um so that was a big big part for him he didn't want his bass drum to be flat he wanted to have some note he wanted to have a, yeah you know, something to reflect off of him it's very similar to the 60s sound he wanted that reflection and and note in the room so to say um little things like that clean <laughs> yeah carpet very clean but he wasn't he didn't demand these things it's just that it's charlie watts so you're going to do your very best to do mm -hmm. you know to get it to get it right and for him to feel super comfortable um so but as far as any little tricks or techniques i don't think he changed much at all of his setup so you know you introduce things and you put like Vince Wilburn had brought in this gorgeous symbol on the left hand side, the stage left, which was the crash of doom. That was a huge addition. So mm -hmm. finding space for that on your stage left side riser was a huge thing. We had to move everything over one full inch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to the yeah. right. That's a huge deal. <laughs> it's a huge, huge deal. deal. <laughs> but you know, as far as like spike marks on his uh, carpet, things like that, there were no tape marks, nothing. It was all indents to where the, the stands and the drums were placed. Um, so it was, you know, there's no, no uh, reflective tape when the lights are hitting it, things like that. Um, I think his biggest thing, he just trusted me to, to make sure it sounded great, but his biggest thing was let's try different snare drums because he's known for his snare drum sound. Mm -hmm. uh, his hi-hat and snare drum sound, I should say. But the snare was always the big thing. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, is, is it, is it, uh, is there enough, is, is it the right tuning? Is it, is it too ringy? Is it too high pitched? Um, we tried a few different things. Studio was, of course, it was a little bit more detailed, but live, we just found, we found a great sound, stuck with it. Yeah. Um, once you found something you like, you stick with it. I think that's his yeah. big thing. Cause he can pull notes out of anything. Mm. I've seen him pull notes out of drums that were rented drums or, <laughs> like the jazz gig that we he would go sit in with who knows what he's going to be playing right. he just found the tone you know? yeah. as long as the angles were right that's what it was about. yeah and that dw snare you're talking about that he got in 2013 the yes. tongue logo that i mean he stuck with that all those years that probably he'd be using that now 
most likely, right? I mean, would yeah, you, would you? Yeah, 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 yeah. At least to finish off the um, the no filter tour, that's for sure. Yeah, At least to yeah. finish that off. John Good handed it to me in 2013, and it just sounded excellent uh, right away. Didn't have to do too much. I pitched it up a little higher, uh, loosened the bottom heads a little bit more near the snare beds so that it didn't have as much buzz on the snare and let it open up. So the yeah. bottom head was a little looser um, than normal, still pitched higher than the top. But also the way he hit that, uh, I think it was at Kenny Jones or, or might have been talking about how he saw um, him hitting always in the direct center. I'm not sure if that was Kenny or if that was um, Simon yeah, Kirk. Who, it might have been, been Simon. Yeah, it might have been Simon. I, but So he was doing that early on and there's heads which show that you know there's a wear mark in the very center. But he actually hit a lot of times up on like, let's just say the 11 o'clock area of the drum. And he would hit that with the rim to get the tone of the head, the rim, and, and the wood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, timbali. It's like almost a timbali sound. Yeah. So I would see yeah. a lot of those marks. He'd come down, hit, drag, lift back up. Hit, drag, lift back up. And he'd mute the snare. So you try that at home, kids, but you're gonna never, yeah. never going to get that sound. And would would he do that? Would would that be like on a on a more sort of ballad type thing, or like would, or could he would he do that in up tempo songs? Up tempo well? stuff, almost every song. Uh, the almost ballad every. stuff, honestly, you know, king of the ballads, playing the king. Of, he would hit that more in the center, let yeah. the drum really ring and be a little lower tone in the center. Really get the for, yeah. for ballads, yeah. yeah. Wow. Now, Angie, Angie's a big part of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The way he just yeah lay on that backbeat and 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 as far as tuning the toms it was bottom head a little tighter than the top head but mm -hmm. yep yep full how interval yep full interval and uh and, and tuned low enough on the rack tom but high enough for it would always be tuned for paint it black yes. that would be that'd be the tom sound that'd go for and i'd listen to it a b the two uh just geek out way too much <laughs> but that's great information. I didn't know that. That's huge right there. That's the brown right, sugar you're... and same with like brown sugar for the floor tom. Those are reference points and to use for that. Uh, Beast of Burden, the bass drum sound for Beast of Burden. If we could try to get the kick and snare sound to sound like Beast of Burden. Those were, those are the benchmarks that we try to set. Um, I don't know if he really ever knew I was doing much of that, but I hope, hope he heard it. You know? I was going to ask you exactly that. I want, did, did you ever discuss that with him? Not really. You just no, we did. We did. You but, did. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, he didn't, it's like, all right, it sounds great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's great information, man. That's, yeah. yeah. A little more in depth in the studio than it was on the, on the live shows, rehearsals yeah. or studio, a little more in depth, you know, we, we get into pitching it correctly. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and I'll just to jump back. I mean, the, the as you say the tom the interval between the the rack tom and the floor tom is huge because mm -hmm. so many of those songs his his rack tom is so big and full and deep mm -hmm. but yet you can't let it get in the way of the floor tom obviously you've got to keep that separation between the two of them so yeah it's challenging to 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 have that it was almost uh, always thought of as a motown rack tom and a rock and roll floor tom <laughs> or 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 a krupa sing 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 floor Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Motown Al Jackson Jr. rack. You know, that's yeah, the, that was yeah. the the two again two reference points. Mm -hmm. Steve Jordan's doing the same thing in a yep. lot of ways. Yeah, those are those are the feelings in which you know we're going for. Wow, sound wise, yeah, great stuff. For those drums, there's a lot of other drums we can geek out on too. But those, <laughs> those drums, that's what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, well this is great. I, I'm going to just there's a, a question I'm going to I'm going to give to you. I think Don, and then. Mm -hmm. um, we're at almost at like 90 minutes so i'm gonna wow. wrap it up pretty i know right. we, and we could go on all day and that's and, for sure and into the night um let's see there's where did that question go so charles t prim um you talk about the importance of the snare for charlie but charlie seemed especially aware of seeing that set as one instrument rather than an assembly of different pieces elvin jones preached that that's a great point yeah like a like a you know like a so, I mean, I don't know if you can, if there's a comment you could make sure. in that regard or. Sure. They have to sing together. They have to, they have to be in harmony together. That makes total sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, I think that what was happening. Exactly. I think he's right on point there. Um, I think what, the, I guess what I would probably say is that the drums themselves 
normally would stay about the same tuning range where the snares always have different character. If it's a brass snare or a metal snare or a wood snare, different thickness plies. Um, like right for now, let's just go into current state. Steve Jordan's using a Craviato single ply birch snare drum. It's a very different sounding snare drum than Charlie's 10 ply DW or even the collector's um, 10 ply, mm. the 610. So each drum, each drum is gonna have its own character but trying to marry them to the kit is very, very important. You know, it either yeah. works or it doesn't. Yeah. Either works or it doesn't, but they can be completely different sounding snare drums. Mm -hmm. But it does, it has to, you have to think about it as a single unit. The whole drum kit has to sing together and be in harmony together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, and not to confuse or, or and this is, is not, uh, I, can, I agree completely and I, and I, I see what, what Charles is saying as well, but mm -hmm. I've always looked at Charlie's kit almost like a like an orchestra like like where everything works together as a as a complete unit yeah but he could get the voices he could get from different parts of the drum kit and a small drum kit i think are just it's he he doesn't get enough credit or or notoriety i guess you know or appreciation for what he was able to draw from two tom toms a bass drum a snare drum and most usually, you know, two symbols and a hi hat, yeah. Um, and 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 it, having it all come together as one voice is a sure. It's just a it was a work of art, you know. Really. And he might have changed his touch if he was sitting behind a kit that didn't sound like uh, somebody would let him borrow. I think it was Dave Green's uh, relative, I believe. I think that's how it is. We'll let him borrow uh, a Radio King kit, White Marine Pearl Radio King kit. It's mm -hmm. in London. You let them borrow that for some jazz gigs and it had calfskin heads. So you're going to get a completely different so sound. Mm -hmm. So where yeah. he hits and how he hits is going to be different because he wants it to sound very, wants to sound like him. So, yeah, I think it, he's just a master of that. He knew how to, he knew how to get tone. out of yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Last question. Um, Anthony Amodio is asking about the legendary, stick bag that Keith Moon gave to Charlie. I don't, do you know the story behind that, Don? Did he, did he tell you that story? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, shit, what is his name? Um, Mooney's Tech. Uh, oh, his was name, it Bill Harrison? Thank you very much, yes. Bill Harrison, yeah, yeah. Wonderful guy. He passed away, yeah. uh, and before he did, he brought, he brought me a drum key, and he brought a little tiny carpet scrap from when he had worked with Charlie to help him with jazz stuff. He worked with Mooney and a bunch of other guys for years. Mm -hmm. yep. Kenny Jones. He this little yep. tiny carpet scrap and he put it on his table and Charlie always had that right there. And he brought me the key, he says. Um, but Bill uh, had gotten that from Mooney and Mooney had said, I want Charlie to have this. And it's uh, the guy who made it is a guy named Glenn Cronkite and it's uh, Reunion Blues bag is what it is i, I bought a, mm. some new ones from him he's still he's in san francisco um, yeah. he's still alive he's still making these things but um beautiful uh, bags yeah. yeah yeah they really are mm -hmm. just bought a couple wow. yeah that's really incredible I, it, was I just, I, it was a gift from mooney to, to charlie that's that's incredible i have a quick bill harrison story if you'll if you'll forgive me i met him a few times lovely lovely man gentleman really was yeah yeah mm -hmm. and and he also worked for ringo uh, mm -hmm. back you know in yeah. the day and i think he was he was the sort of uk jeff chonis i think yeah. in more recent years before bill passed it, he would had a storage unit yeah. and would move items and be cartage for people yeah, yeah yeah and so i was at the stones office this was probably in the early 2000s maybe close to 20 years ago and it was ahead of charlie doing a, a stint at ronnie scott's with his his jazz group with the tentet and i was having lunch with him and sherry and Bill Harrison happened to be at the office that day as well. And they were discussing some logistics for the upcoming run at Ronnie Scott's. So we went out and had lunch at this place near the office. And it was, I think Tina Clark from Zildjian UK was there and Bob, myself, Charlie, Sherry, and Bill. And so we go back to the office and we're all kind of getting ready to leave. <laughs> and, and Charlie, with his sense of humor, he said, so what's, what's next, Bill? He said, you know, we just had lunch. You're going to have supper with Ringo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, it was, and Bill, 
<laughs> check to the stars. stars. Yeah. 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 And Bill just started <laughs> laughing. You know, they were just kind of winding each other up. It was, a, you know, yeah. it was a, a great, um, he had such a great sense of humor, Charlie, you know, and it he was did. just, he just kind of went, you know, so now we'll catch what? you all I, the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Supper with Ringo. Oh man. <laughs> this is great. Life stuff, isn't guys. so bad, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for doing this. You know, again, I, I say this all the time, but we've, we, I feel like we've really just barely scraped the surface here. So mm -hmm. I may be uh, calling on you again in the not too distant future to, you know, continue this. Well, down the road, you know, we'll, we'll do something that we can all kind of uh, contribute to and, and have fun with. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it takes some time, but yeah, we'll, we'll all be able to contribute again to something very cool. To honor, to honor Charlie. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. You know, I, I'm all in for that. So thank you. Thank you both so much, Don. Thank you for doing this on your day off on, on the yeah. Stones tour. And, and mm -hmm. uh, Richard, Glad thank to do you it. for Glad to be here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And Richard, thanks for taking time out of your Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go up and watch some football. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. It is today. Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, thanks uh, for putting so, it together. This is my awesome. pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you. This is great. And uh, and everybody, I'll put this up on YouTube later if you happen to miss it. Well, if you're watching this right now, you didn't miss it, but you know what I mean. Um, gentlemen, don't go away. I'm gonna. I'm, we'll say goodbye in the uh, in the room, but I'll sign off here from the live stream. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna. Um, I'm going to end the recording. And uh, thank thank you everybody for watching. A big hand for Don McCauley. Absolutely. And Richard King. All right. Two great men, two great friends. And uh, and thank you very much. Okay, guys, hang tight for one second.